This episode of The Kingdom of Graph is sponsored by The Autograph of the Month Club, where for just $20 a month, you can get a signed 8x10 photo in the mail. Please visit them at www.autographofthemonth.com. Use promo code KINGDOM to get a bonus welcome autograph with your first subscription to Autograph of the Month Club. Listeners, prepare thyself, for you are about to witness two fine gentlemen muse upon the fandom realm, for you have ventured upon the kingdom of Graf. Hosted by Marco Guerrero and Michael Berkowitz. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Kingdom of Graph, everybody. I'm Marco Guerrero. I'm Michael Berkowitz. Um, I'm apparently Keith R. A. DeCandido. At least that's what it says under my face here. So, <laughs> yeah, we uh, we were gonna ask for your ID before you came on. But, uh, <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I, I look just like the picture there. There you go. I was like, <laughs> he hasn't changed. I have slightly that. more hair now, but I think we can blame the current apocalypse for that. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to just recognize you without the Dragon Con rush going on all around, and you having to go from <laughs> one from one meeting to the next meeting to the next thing, and getting yeah. like uh, five seconds with you before you have to run off. Yeah. <laughs> That 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 sounds about right for Dragon Con, yeah. Uh, Dragon Con was it used to be one of my favorite. It used to be my favorite convention, and then it got towards the last few years, it got a little bit out of hand. And ever since they moved the uh, the the show floor, or, or like not the show floor, I should say, but like the the dealer room, so far away. I, yeah. It, 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 it's it that 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 they they've gotten better at at. Managing the crowds there um, last year, well, not last year, obviously, but uh, in, in 2019 in particular, I think they did a much better job of managing uh, the crowds in the uh, in the America's Mart. It's 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 rough, you know, when you don't actually have one large convention center, but are spread out over so much space, to, you know, complicates. For you bit, guys out there who don't know about Dragon Con, it's basically once a year, uh, the weekend after Labor Day, I'm sure. No, it's or Labor, Labor, Day, Labor Day weekend. Labor Day weekend. Basically, uh, all five hotels in the downtown Peachtree area get taken over, like the entire hotels, like the Merrimart, and it turns into one big convention center. And uh, it's very, it's like Comic-Con without all of the commercial stuff, like the major commercial stuff. So you don't have Marvel, you don't have DC, you don't have, you know, Fox and... Well... Hang on, Marco. I think you're missing one thing. So, for those out there that are watching, conventions were these things where mass <laughs> people used to gather together, and <laughs> yeah, where you weren't allowed to stay more than six inches apart. <laughs> but people right. chose to wear a mask. A lot of them chose to wear masks, <laughs> and many chose not to wear deodorant. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or they chose just you know. It's swimming upstream against everything else going on. Anyhow. <laughs> but that was always my favorite. The people that would wear the the huge cosplay mm-hmm. and they would walk against the crowd. Right. <laughs> yes. Now if <laughs> because where they're going is the other way. You know, what do you do? Now if you were I don't think uh, Georgia had the, the, the five cent bottle returns, but like if you wanted to be a millionaire or you were a collector of uh, alcohol bottles. All you had to do is walk up and down yeah. the hallways of every single hotel room was just nothing but alcohol bottles outside. Pretty much. <laughs> but anyways, uh, memories, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Keith, uh, I know you because I was one of the one of the brown coats in New York before Serenity came out, like back in Firefly. Right. So I was one of the original brown coats in New York. Uh, we used to meet up and talk Firefly before Serenity came out, like – um mm-hmm. and just because we were we were like, hey, let's go to a bar every Saturday and talk Firefly. 
<laughs> and uh, you were in it bef- a little bit before I came around. So when the movie did come out and I had started working with the actors and doing signings, I had about 40 copies of the book and you generously came to my office, signed all of them. And, yep. you know, I gave those out to everybody who like ordering like stuff. And I just were handing those things out like candy. <laughs> and and that's how we kind of, you know, met. And so first off, can you tell us a little bit about the process of writing a novelization? Like you get the script, right? Like you're working off the script before yeah. it's even filmed, right? Yeah, you kind of have to. Um, the lead time for uh, writing a book is long enough that you, you generally only have the script to work with. Sometimes you'll get more than that. Um, the uh, sometimes you'll be able to see like stills or production material or whatever. Um, sometimes you get to see a rough cut of the film. Serenity was actually an interesting case in that when I got the assignment in the fall of 2004, the movie was supposed to be released in April of 2005, mm. and I had two and a half weeks to write the book. Jeez. That was a very intense two and a half weeks, let me tell you. Um, and I busted my butt and several other body parts, and I got the damn thing done. Uh, it was due the Monday before Thanksgiving of 2004. And that was like the drop dead date. I could get it in so we could still get it out in time for uh, the April 2005 release. So the Monday Thanksgiving weekend, I, I, I turn in the manuscript and then I take a nap. Um, and uh, I I email it to my editor my editor emails a copy to production so they can start that process they email a copy to Universal Pictures for the approvals process I wake up Tuesday morning and Joss Whedon shows up on the internet and says hey kids we just moved the movie from April to September (laughs) you know when they have those shots of a city skyline and a guy screaming loudly that was me (laughs) um I, I and I could have had six more months to write the damn thing, and um, and of course, and the best part was we couldn't confirm this because it was Thanksgiving week. Everybody had gone home, so like we didn't actually get confirmation until you know the following Monday, uh, and and we were just you know just completely going nuts trying to figure out what was going on here. The good news was I had time to you know fix some stuff and 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 adjust some things that that had changed in the movie um there's never a complete one-to-one match because they were always changing things during filming um plus you have to add material i mean it's it's the a, a movie doesn't actually have a novel's worth of story in it so anytime you're novelizing a film you have to you have to add stuff you you if you don't uh, you're not going to have enough to, uh, story to make up a book. So you have to add things. With with Serenity, it was a little easier because I had 14 hours of backstory from the Firefly TV show to play with, which helped immensely. Um, but other movie novelizations that I've done, I've had to just, I've had to add things. I've had to uh, add bridging material, add more scenes in. Um, there was one, one movie novelization I did for the third Resident Evil movie, Extinction. Um, there, I did an entire sequence at the beginning of the book that actually bridged the gap between the end of the previous movie apocalypse and the beginning of extinction because there was apocalypse ended with raccoon city being nuked and the zombie apocalypse seemingly being averted because they nuked raccoon city extinction opens with the zombie apocalypse already being like a year old so how we got from one state of affairs to the other state of affairs wasn't really like it was fobbed off in a voiceover but not really explicated so the filmmakers gave me the okay to fill that gap in. So I picked up from the end of Apocalypse and filled in how they got from from there, from the one spot to the other. So that helped, you know, flesh the book out a little bit more. So do you um, have, when that happens, do you have, like, creative control over that? Or were you giving constraints and kind of structure to it? Uh, halfway between those two. Um, it Basically, I had to provide them with a basic outline of what I wanted to do, and they had to approve it. Mm-hmm. Um, in some cases they were just, you know, like, uh, in the, in that same one, in the extinction one, uh, the character of Jill Valentine wasn't in the movie because the actress wasn't available, but they wanted, they wanted me to do something with the character, like to explain what she was doing so they could use the character in later films if they, if they wanted to. So, uh, they gave me pretty much carte blanche to do whatever I want as long as she was still alive at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, 
So, uh, and in other cases, you know, you, you're always in, in any licensed work, whether it's a novelization or an original novel based on an existing property, you're working with the people who own it. Um, usually it's somebody in the licensing department. So you, you're, you're never working entirely on your own. Um, the author, the editor and the people in licensing are all working together on making the story work. Um, how closely they all work together and how much influence the different parties have varies wildly from license to license. Um, you know, there, there are some licensors who don't give a damn. There are some who are incredibly involved. Um, and every, and every possibility between those two extremes, um, it really does vary. You know, I've, I've worked on over 30 different licensed universes, um, from alien to Zorro. And, um, each one is, each one is different from every other one. You know, it, it varies from project to project and, and from license to license. Yeah, I like what you did there. You went from Alien to Zorro, like A to Z, right? <laughs> I was so happy when I finally did an Alien story because it meant I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't have an A license in, uh, until then. So that was nice. So in That's Firefly, awesome. I know the, the couple, like one thing that you added from the original was, I guess, the, the whole Zac Efron scene from Firefly you put into the book, right? Like the, a little bit of the River Simon backstory when they were kids somebody would say oh yeah um i mean a lot of that yeah i, I a lot of that was in the tv right. show i mean there was actual flashbacks from i, I fleshed them out yeah. some um but, but some of the flashbacks that we got uh in various episodes and then um and then also the description that Simon had in the pilot episode of, of how river was rescued which i had to reconcile with the actual dramatization that we got in the film, yeah. the two did not match up exactly. So <laughs> I had to, I had to make that work. Um, yeah, because I think even so, I, the... I mean, I fleshed it out and I added some scenes to it, but it was all based on the information we were given, uh, both uh, in the two episodes of the TV yeah. show and and in the movie. The one thing that I used to refer to all the time when I would tell people to get pick, to pick pick up the book was, you know, the series set up a lot of uh, mystery behind the the Shepherd book character, right? Yes. And yeah. there's a scene that was cut from the movie. It was in the script, I'm guessing, right? Uh, where book shoots down a ship and he meets the operative on Haven and the operative knows him, that, calls him by his, that was not cut from the movie. That was, I made that. Oh, one. you made that up. <laughs> oh yeah. That was um, the, the, I was given very specific instructions as to what I could and couldn't do with book, and that was as far as I was able to go. Ah, see, um, originally I thought I thought I had, that was actually a scene that was cut from the movie. No, there are scenes in the novelization that are that were cut from the movie. There's a bunch, including a bunch of scenes with an R right. uh, that were in the script that did not make it to the final film. Um, but uh, no, this the scene dramatizing the attack on Haven uh, that was all me. Right. Um, and in fact, if if you read that scene, you'll notice that not in that scene and not in any other scene are we actually in Shepard's book's head. Right. Um, the little kid who dies. Every that. every character in the movie gets a PO, at least one PO, and sometimes several POV scenes. Uh, the exception there is book. I because I was not allowed to reveal anything specific about him. Uh, I didn't even get into his head. Yeah. Uh, that was, you know, the, 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 that, that, the scene of the attack on Haven was done from the point of view of one of the other people living there. So for uh, me, that, for precisely that, that was the first time I saw, uh, Shepard's first name. Uh, was it Dare? Der that was, that was out of the, that was from the movie. That was, uh, from, specifically from his, uh, his grave marker. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. uh, you hear like the operative, like knows all about him. I always love that. And, I you know, and because it went back to the thing. Well, the operative knows all about everything. That's his yeah. whole thing. That, there's an interesting <laughs> aspect of the movie that, that was in the script and which I kept in the novelization because it was a neat idea. It wound up not being in the final movie for one of two possible reasons. Um, the original conception of the operative was that he wore a pair of glasses that had data scrolling on it. Oh. And he had constant access to constant information from those glasses. In the script, he wore them all the time and there was constantly data on them. In the movie that didn't, I think, I think the glasses made it into like one scene in the, in the final cut of the movie. My guess, and this is based on no inside information whatsoever, but merely a guess, um, is that either A, they couldn't make the special effect work, which is perfectly possible, or B, once they cast Chuetel Ejiofor, 
they decided not to put glasses on him because he's got huge, wonderfully expressive eyes, and you don't want to cover those right. up. <laughs> um, so before the or both, I don't know, but I kept that in the because in the novelization it doesn't matter who's playing the right. character, and and I have an unlimited special effects budget when I write a novel, so <laughs> that didn't really apply, and it was a neat concept. And it was a really neat science fictional concept, and I didn't want to lose it. So I, even though I, even though when I found out in time to change it, I didn't think it was worth it. I wanted to keep that. That was a neat idea. So um, for that reason, that's still in there in the novel. So before when when uh, Serenity got pushed back, one of the reasons why I got pushed back is they were doing a bunch of testing. Right? They they did uh, screenings in like was it five cities, and then it jumped to like sixteen cities uh, yeah. before the movie came out. And these were ones where some of the effects weren't done, the audio wasn't done, so they had like music from like Star Wars. And did you, yeah, you know, now did you get a chance to go to any of those screenings? Yeah, I went to the one in Hartford. Okay, see, I went to the one in, I went to two. I went to the first one, first round, which was in New Jersey. Uh, that was Mm -hmm. the first time I had walked down a street and saw a car on fire and everybody just hanging out. It was in New (laughs) Jersey. (laughs) <laughs> well, if you're gonna see a car on fire, New Jersey well, is a good place. There's about yeah. there's about a ten minute walk from the train to the mall where the the movie was being screened, and it's not mm-hmm. really the nicest neighborhood that you really want to walk through at night. <laughs> gotcha. And um, the second time was in Boston, uh, and the first screening was in a smaller one. I think there was only about sixty people, right? Mm-hmm. And we all saw it for the first time, so we were all like shook, you know, after that first screening, right? Everybody knows why mm-hmm. everybody's shook at the end of that movie, right? So when yeah. I went to Boston, it was a huge theater, probably about 650 people. All diehard Brown Coats fans, almost, I'd say 95% of them seeing it for the first time. So now before the movie, we're all singing all the songs, you know, the hero of Canton, blah, blah, blah. And so when that scene towards the end comes up, I'm like looking around the audience, just waiting to see everybody's reaction. <laughs> so you knowing that that happens from writing it, you know, were, mm-hmm. was it the same way when you were seeing it in the theater what, when people watching it for the first time to kind of to see what people's reactions were to that scene? I was curious, yeah, as as to how they were going to react, and it was it was amusing. Um, what about when you it read was, it? It was there was basically a collective gasp that rose <laughs> up from the entire uh, audience in Hartford. Um, it, it, what was interesting watching it, because, you know, at that point I had, I had I had written a novel version of it and I had read it in the script, but I hadn't actually seen it until I saw that screening. And it wasn't until um, it wasn't until watching it that I realized the effect that it had, because at that moment, I mean, it's a it's a it's a 15 year old movie. I don't think spoilers are an right. issue. This was this was Wash getting killed. Right. And. What 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 didn't really hit me on a visceral level until I saw it was that it changed the tone of the movie after that because the characters weren't immortal anymore. Right. Everybody's like, you know, when you're watching a TV show, there's a certain level of immortality that you expect on characters, at least at least assuming you're not watching Game of Thrones. And so you you don't expect anybody to die. Wash getting killed, the stakes got upped. From that point forward, it's like, crap, anybody could die at this point. Even the first time um, I watched it. And it really added... Even the first time I watched it, right, when Zoe gets split with that axe, I thought she actually yeah. got split with the axe. Like, there was no coming back from that. Yeah. Like, so when they showed her and they're, like, putting the cream or the spray the the yeah. on her, I'm like, oh, wait, she actually made it out. You know what I mean? Right. And that's – but that but that's what Killing – that's that's what Killing Wash accomplished. Right. And that's yeah. why I felt like the Shepherd Book's death was such a waste. You know, what yeah. I mean? like I, I, I don't know what the deal was with that, but to me, because they didn't get a chance to set him up in the movie, other than like for the people who had watched the series. Well, that was true of half the movie. Yeah. That was uh, the, the movie didn't stand on its own nearly as well as it should have. I don't think, uh, which is why I think it was it was one of those movies that was not neither neither a success nor a failure. It was just you know, yeah, it it. It made it made back the money it cost, and that was about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we were talking about like uh, originally there was going to be three movies, and it had to make thirty five million to be greenlit. You know, yeah. and it just it hit I think twenty eight, and I think part of that too was they did so many screenings, and a lot of people had already seen it two or three times by the time yeah. it came out. But 
Yeah, I think that was a, that was a miscalculation. But I mean, it, I mean, it it happens. You know, most uh, the, just the fact that the movie get, got made was a small miracle. Well, uh, as far as the reboot or remake or uh, uh, continuation, I know you're 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 a non-believer. You think it's clickbait? I'm I'm wait. I will believe it's going to happen when it's reported by a news source, which it hasn't been yet. Well, we had PJ Harsma, who's you know works uh, with. Uh, Alan and uh, Nathan all the time and he was on here and he was talking about how Nathan's actually been in the works to buy the rights to the to the series right the uh, problem is is it's split between Universal and Disney right and that's the problem that he's having so I mean it, it's yeah that's 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 been an issue with the, with the licensing material the um the the novel that I did the novelization I did was with Universal um I did uh, something for the Firefly role-playing game. That licensing deal was specifically with, with at the time, 20th Century Fox. Mm. And we were not allowed to refer to anything from the movie at all mm. uh, in the role-playing game. I'm pretty sure that's true of Titan's current license, too, is that it, they're, they're Firefly and therefore are only able to refer to the TV show and not anything from the movie because that's a different company. It's, uh, it's a lovely I'm the kind of the geek who bought both <laughs> because I wanted the, all the expanded information on the worlds. And like I bought yep. the first uh, Serenity uh, RPG because it had the cool maps of every planet and you know then like all of the ships and so I have both uh, versions the Firefly and but but from a, from a legal perspective they're two separate licenses, yeah. <laughs> um, which which just complicates matters even more and and also makes it more complicated to do to do any kind of spinoff or, or sequel or reboot or anything with the property. So I'm a fan. Like we were we were. We were on this show, we talk about like uh, what they've done with Cobra Kai and what they've done with The Mandalorian. Yes, and how they're yeah. able to introduce the series to a whole new generation and still honor and not shove in your face <laughs> the previous stuff, right? Like uh, it make they earn a lot of those cameos, and yeah, uh, we've talked several times. Like, what would I do if I was, you know, rebooting or in charge or had some say? And my idea is that you you go ahead, take the time jump. What happens is the alliance has weakened, right? And that you find out that the there's a lot of people behind the alliance. Corp, they're all corporations, with the biggest one being the Blue Sun Group. And so you're running across a kind of a group of like hackers, activists, hacktivists, or whatever you want to call it, that are trying to infiltrate and take down the Blue Sun Group. And that's kind of where you pick off, where you pick up. Like it's a whole new crew, who knew something. And then every once in a while, you can have a cameo. Like here comes River. Maybe she leads a resistance in a certain part of a sector that they have to interact with. Maybe Jane has taken over for Badger in an area, right? Like, like you have all these different characters who are that you could bring onto the show in different situations, right? Like maybe Mal is actually in prison, and you actually. Or breaking somebody else out, and he's like in the cell next door. So you know what I mean. Like that's how I would approach mm. it. If you had the freedom to do some kind of something in that universe, what would you do? I I don't know. Um, I, there, there's a number of different ways you can go with it. The world's pretty wide open to a bunch of different possibilities. One thing I would definitely do is uh, commit more aggressively to the letter of the world building. Um, I, 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 one of my problems with Firefly as a TV show is that it posited a future that was dominated by Chinese culture and yet had absolutely no Asians in the stat, in the cast, um, <laughs> which, uh, I was, I, I had a problem with that. Well, you did um, have the ones that were selling dogs at the, uh, in the booths, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and for that matter, you know, the characters of, of Simon and River Tam, their last name, they had Chinese last names. They should have been cast with, with Asian actors. Um, the, but it, even, even with that, I think showing def, I think, I think the, the, what your suggestion was, is, is on the right track. The idea of, of seeing the effects 20 years on, uh, of, what what happened in Serenity of of the revelation there, um, and and the damage that it did to the alliance in the short term and in the long term, that there's fodder for storytelling there, um, you know, and and 
people trying to, you know, uh, and, and probably I think what would be interesting is following characters who go back and forth between the two worlds, you know, have, have the divide between the Alliance and the outer worlds be even sharper. Uh, and, and focus on characters who go back and forth between the two and showing the difference between the people who live out on the raggedy edge, as Mal called it, and the people who live in luxury in the in the inner planets. Yeah, I, I thought too. Part of it. Well, have the class difference. Well, I thought one of the fun parts of it is that even in the like when we see Ariel on the show, it's perfect, right? There's mm-hmm. not nothing, right? Yeah. But maybe now there's graffiti. Maybe now there's you know some protests. You know, maybe there's. It's just it's not as neat or as orderly as it was. You know, I mean, it was how I was thinking about approaching it. Um, you know, it's just Whatever. little things like that. It's not something that anybody's likely to ask me to do anyway. Well, so. Did you ever see uh, <laughs> one of the things that I always thought two shows that were done uh, that could have been set in the Firefly universe was Dark Matter and Killjoys. Did you ever get a chance mm-hmm. to watch either one of those? I haven't seen either one, no. I, I the... One 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 of the one of the problems with being a a fan and and a person who writes about pop culture right now is that there's a whole lot of it. <laughs> well, we were having this and, talk and earlier, huh? Yeah, yeah. it's it's really hard to keep track of everything. Um, and there's there's a lot of things that I still ha- I still haven't seen the Expanse yet, what? which is just embarrassing. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't either. Don't worry. I yeah, and it's just I mean, either. it's just there, there's only 24 hours in the day, and I have to give priority to things that I am either writing stories in or writing articles about. Right. Um, so, you know, the, I, it, the, it complicates things. And, and so there's stuff that I just haven't gotten to yet. And, and, and there's plenty of stuff I want to get to. And, and one of the, <laughs> one of the few good things about the last year uh, is that I have been able to actually like catch up on some things that I've been meaning to get to, but there's still plenty of other things on that list. And both Killjoys and Dark Matter are on that list, as is the expense well, of things I just would like to I see. I always bring it up because, you know, they literally could be set in the world. Like uh, Dark Matter, again, you're going up against corporations, right? It's all about evil mm-hmm. corporations that control the new, the, the, the galaxy that they're in, right? Killjoys is all right. about bounty hunters, set up in again in a world controlled by largely by corporations and isolating and and again i i just so i always like to get people's take if they've seen it you know um although i don't know i know that you've been in karate for many years you're a second or third degree black belt third degree now. all right so can you talk a little bit about like if you're writing an action scene right does a lot of your your experience in that realm help you? Not as much as you might think. Um, actually, <laughs> uh, the biggest problem. So I've, I've I've written a lot of fiction that has action scenes in them because I've written a lot of stories that involve uh, superheroes, that involve Klingons, that involve cops. Um, and and so on. So uh, fight scenes have been part of my fiction pretty much all along. When I first started, my, my first started writing in the mid nineteen nineties. I first started training uh, in karate in two thousand four when I'd already been writing for ten years. And when I first started training, it had a really bad effect because I was over I was overdoing it because I understood this all now. I know how punches work and 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 what you have to do in order to, you know, hurt somebody and 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 how, you know, how you kick somebody and how you have to position yourself and balance yourself. And I was putting it all on the paper. Um I was I was explaining <laughs> in frankly excruciating detail uh, each fight scenes and they were becoming too clinical and too uninteresting. So I had to <laughs> dial that back. Um at this point, I think I've I've hit a happy medium where where between um, the 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 straight up you know what and part of it depends on what you're writing too. When you're writing us, the the fight scenes you write in a superhero novel are different from the ones you write in say a Star Trek novel involving Klingons, uh, and and you know others are like in the the fantasy universes that I, a lot of the fantasy universes I write in it's, is a bit more stylized. Um, so it depends, but. Um, there was a time there where it was informing my writing too much. Um, at this point, like I said, I think I've, I think I've struck a balance. 
So for a lot of you uh, don't know, you write a lot of licensed material um, where they right. come to you. Like you did what four or five novels in the supernatural original novels, right? In the super uh, three, I did three three supernatural novels. And uh, so those were original stories. I think the first yes. one takes place in New York, and as I was, you know, almost the show never goes to major cities, you know, and well, that that was one of the reasons for that. Why, why, why I did that, and and about half there have been all together seventeen supernatural novels, and about half of them take place in places where the show does not normally go, and to my mind, that's that's one of the things that tie-in novels can do really well. Um, one one of the things I try to do when I'm writing a work of licensed fiction is to do something that the source material can't do. In the case of Supernatural, they drive all over the country in their cool car, but everywhere they go looks just like Vancouver. Right. The same hotel room <laughs> where they just flip it. Right. Um, and, and Well, the hotel room doesn't bother me as much because they can only stay in cheap places and they really do all look alike. But... Um, <laughs> But but the the because they're constrained by location, they never go to New York. They never go to New Orleans. They never go to well. Well, they went to Baltimore once. Um, they you know they only went to Los Angeles once, and they made fun of the fact that the weather was bad. You know to to cover up the fact that they were in Vancouver. So, uh, but in a, in a novel, you don't have that constraint. Um, the supernatural novels can embrace the location in a way the show can't. So I took the boys to New York City. I took them to Key West, which is a perfect place for a supernatural story, um, but which you could also never convincingly make Vancouver look like. Uh, and and then for the, my third novel, I took them to San Francisco. Uh, Jeff Marriott took them to the Southwest, uh, which is where he's from. Um, Alice Henderson took them to Sierra Nevada, the Sierra Nevada. Um, and and uh, I think somebody else, I forget which author it was, uh, took them to... Uh, to the deep south in Georgia, um, all locations that they they generally avoided on the show, uh, sticking instead with midwestern suburbs, basically. So when we were talking, we were talking about like with like with Firefly Serenity, you were provided a script that you then novelized, right? But with with this situation of an original story based in a universe with like supernatural, did you have a story idea that you pitched, or did the studio come to you and say? We want books, and we want you to create a story because you 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 did the first one, right? Your number yeah, yours was it, number one. Exactly. The it varies from book to book. Um, mo most of my licensed fiction has been original fiction, not not novelizations. I've only written a small handful of novelizations, um, but with each project, it depends. Sometimes, in the case of Supernatural, uh, the 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 stories were all mine, and I pitched them, and they either yeah you know, would go for them or not. Excuse me. Um, in other cases, for example, um, I wrote a StarCraft novel called Nova, which the, about a thir two thirds of the plot was dictated to me by Blizzard Games. I wrote a World of Warcraft novel where the 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 novel was plotted out in a two hour phone conversation between me and Chris Metzen at Blizzard back when he was in charge of the story. Um, there are other cases where you know they, they said we want you to do a book about X, and then I flesh it out. Uh, <laughs> others where I completely come up with the story whole cloth. It really does vary. In the case of the supernatural novels, those three were all mine. Uh, they were they were my stories that I pitched and that they went for. So that's such a cool like the idea that. So how did how did that happen that that you got into? Because I'm I'm assuming you were an original story writer first. So then how does it get to like a studio's like hey here's a movie script obviously probably sign like a stack of non-disclosures and create a book on it. Like how did that, what was your first? I actually started out doing licensed fiction. Um, I started out as an editor doing okay. it. Okay. Um, I worked for the late Byron Price from 1993 until 1998. And, um, and I worked as an editor on a lot of different licensed products. Um, so I was the guy hiring writers for these things. <laughs> um, that was that was I, I did that job uh, for like I said for for five years, and um, it was through that that I actually made my first short story sale, um, in in the most ridiculous manner possible. Uh, the biggest project I did when I worked for Byron was a series of novels and short story collections based on Marvel superheroes. Oh, um, nice. Prior to two thousand eight, it was the largest, most comprehensive 
set of stories about Marvel superheroes not told in a comic book. Um, <laughs> we we did like fifty four different novels and and anthologies that were connected. We had we had one big continuity. It wasn't just a bunch of standalone stories featuring them. Yeah. Uh, we actually had our own little internal continuity among the novels going. Um, and and like I said, up up until oh wait, it was the biggest such available. And then Kevin Feige went and stole my thunder, the bastard. <laughs> but um, uh, for one of the first projects we did for that was uh, Spider Man anthology, and it was we had submitted six different Venom stories. Oh, wow. Um, all of which were rejected by Marvel. Uh, and we're past the 11th hour, and my co-editor and I were like, uh, guys, what do you want to see? Because Venom was on the cover of the book, and this was 1994. Venom was at the height of his popularity. We couldn't not have a Venom story in the book. And finally, we just said, look, guys, what do you want to see in a Venom story? And they gave us a sentence. And in about three days, John and I wrote this story. <laughs> so that was my first short story sale. Um after that, I did I did a couple of other Marvel short stories, and being an editor gave me the opportunity to pitch to other projects. Uh, for example, I wrote a Doctor Who story in 1996 for an anthology called Decalogue 3, which was one of the Doctor Who anthologies that Virgin published at the time. One of the editors on that book was somebody who had written an X-Men short story for me for the Marvel anthologies, as well as another short story for another anthology I did. Um, so I was already talking to him. And he mentioned he was doing a Doctor Who anthology. And I said, oh, I've been watching Doctor Who since I was eight. Can I pitch something, please? Um, and they went for it. And it just, it snowballed from there. Um, you know, the the opportunities to pitch presented themselves partly due to, to my position as an editor. Um, and eventually I wrote a Spider-Man novel. I wrote a couple of young Hercules novels. Um, and, and wrote a Buffy the Vampire Slayer novelization. Uh, and then I was hired to write my first Star Trek novel, and then it all went crazy from there. Now, did you have so, Nick Stahl a, uh, voice your young Hercules? Oh my gosh, that's an inside <laughs> joke. With the, <laughs> we, yeah, I, I, why would Nick Stahl voice? We had Hercules Nick Stahl on a couple on episodes own, yeah. ago, and we were talking about <laughs> IMDb and how sometimes things get posted on there that aren't true. And they had him oh. as a voice actor for young young Hercules. But he never did that or had anything to do with. And it was a live action show anyway. Right. And so, <laughs> and so there was like people used to come up to him all the time. Oh, you did the voice for Young Hercules, you know, this and that. And he's like, no, no, I was that. And so it was just funny that, you know, you were talking about Young Hercules and then a couple episodes we had. I just, I just love whenever I, because I've got, I still got like a bunch of copies of those Young Hercules books, which I wrote in 1999. Uh, and I got a, I got it like boxes full of copies of the damn things. And, um, I love when I bring them out at conventions and stuff and people look at it and say, Oh my God, that's Ryan Gosling. Cause that was one of Ryan Gosling's first big roles before <laughs> he became Ryan Gosling movie star. Yeah. He was, he was the teenage kid who played young Hercules. We were just talking, uh, about something similar to that with, uh, Peter David. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've known Peter David, you know, from Dragon Con and a couple other things. And I did one of my first signings was with Jewel State. And he gave mm -hmm. me a copy of Space Cadets, his script, Space, Space Cases. Uh, and he yeah. signed the, the, the script for the pilot. And then I uh, had Jewel sign it. So I have a, you know, yeah. signed by Jewel and uh, Peter. And um, so, yeah, I, I, the idea that, you know, the reason I brought that up was you were talking about pulling something out at a show. And he was just at the show. And he's oh, like, yeah. hey, look, I have this script right here. <laughs> Yeah, Peter does that. <laughs> and so it was just funny because, you know, Joel also played the, the mechanic on the show as well. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah, it was funny, actually, talking about the the uh, the delay in the in Serenity's release. Joel and I were both guests at a convention uh, here in the New York area called Icon in 2005. And they had gotten Joel to be a guest for it. And it took place. It was in April of 2005. And one of the reasons why they got wanted to get Joel in particular was because that was when the movie was supposed to be released and then it got right. delayed. And Jewel was so grateful that I was there because I was literally the only person she could talk to, to about mm -hmm. the movie with. Because I had signed the same non-disclosure agreement she did. <laughs> and, and, but we could talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I had some good times at Icon. I used to have a booth there every once in a while. Yeah. And, um, oh. yeah, I missed that show. It was, uh, 
That was a show that was unfortunately actually destroyed by a hurricane, of all things. It was um, at Stony Brook but, every year. Yeah, yeah. And then um, the facility was trashed by Superstorm Sandy in 2011, and it never they never were able yeah. to come back from That's that. That's where I met, uh, what's his name? He did all the artwork for uh, Dungeons & Dragons. Um, okay. It was the very first one. Um, I, my mind's going blank. But anyways... But we got to spend like the whole weekend together. It was a lot of fun. Um, here, so I got a I got a viewer question here from uh, Kyle Brady. He's actually a, he's a pretty big fan of yours. Um, okay. Uh, he so I I think what he's going with here is: Do you ever receive a script that they haven't announced who's playing roles yet? So because like his question is, when writing with a specific, do you have like a specific talent in mind? Or do you then have to make changes based on their appearance once you find out who's playing that role? Okay, for, for novelizations in particular, yes, there are times when you don't know who's playing what part. Um, in particular, I, I recall um, a movie, a horror movie I novelized back in 2003 called Darkness Falls, where a character was described in the script as being African-American and they wound up casting a white guy. <laughs> I was able to change that at the last minute. Um, but you don't always know. Um, so it's, it, yeah, what, what you do is you, for the most part, you generally avoid descriptions if you don't know who it is. I was lucky with um, the super, uh, with the Serenity novelization and also the Resident, uh, the Resident Evil ones I did in that I, I knew who was at least playing everybody in all of them. Uh, yeah. If, even if I didn't, uh, even if I didn't, um, I even if I hadn't like seen them in the, heard them in the role or seen them in the role, I knew who was playing it, so at least I had something to go on. So yeah, um, yeah, Serenity. Like I said, Serenity was easy because because you had the, the you had the story you had the story. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. That's and, and the thing is, that's one of the most important aspects of writing this type of fiction is character voices, because you're writing characters that most of the people reading it know what they're supposed to sound like. So. Um, you have to like if you write dialogue for Captain Picard that doesn't sound like something Patrick Stewart will say, the reader will reject your no, your your book, um, and you got to watch that. You got to you got to be careful uh, to make sure. There was one time there was one uh, Star Trek piece that I wrote. Uh, it was actually a team up between Picard and Cisco, hmm. uh, which we never really saw on screen beyond the first Deep Space Nine episode. But again. Tie-in fiction, we're not constrained by actor availability or budget. So we can do stuff like that. And there was an exchange between Picard and Cisco, and there was one line of dialogue that I had originally given to Picard, and I realized, no, Cisco has to be the one to say this. And I wound up changing every single word in the sentence because Avery Brooks and Patrick Stewart don't talk the same way. <laughs> um, and so I had to, I had to adjust it for that and that's something you have to be conscious of when when you're writing this and it can, and with a novelization it can be really challenging if you don't know who's playing the part well that brings me up so to my kind of, my uh, next question uh okay. you're dealing with some very very passionate fan bases in the stuff that you're writing a little bit yeah i mean i'm talking like hardcore right like oh, yeah. um so when you're writing you have to know all of the little things right or they get on you right so and sometimes, even if you do know them, they get on you anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> so, how much research do you end up doing, or do you only take on these things as much as I possibly can? Um, and 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 thank God for online wikis, man. I don't know how the hell I did this job twenty five years ago. Um, uh, the the uh, some fandoms in particular are so good at collecting online resources. Like start the the Star Trek one, uh, Memory Alpha, is phenomenal. Um, the supernatural ones are hit and miss, but generally pretty good. Um, and they've, they've gotten better. Um, the, you know, others are, are less complete. I know the, the one for alien and predator, the alien and predator universes are also really good. Uh, those are helpful. I mean, the most important research to do really is to just sit down and watch the damn thing. Um, for some projects, this is easier than others. I mean, obviously, if you're writing a Star Trek novel, you can't sit down and watch 54 years worth of, of TV and movies. That's not feasible. Um, at the very least, though, when I'm when I've done a Star Trek project, I've uh, made sure to watch as much as many episodes and movies as are relevant to my story as possible. 
for something smaller scale, like when I wrote a leverage novel or when I wrote the Farscape comic book uh, or, or something like that, or when I did the Sleepy Hollow novel I did a few years ago, then I, I absolutely mainline everything I can about the show. With Supernatural, I did that too because I wrote it. Those three novels I wrote early enough in the show's run um, the, during, the, during the second, third, and fifth seasons, respectively, that I was able to, to binge the whole thing each time. Just to so get a, to get the voices in my head and to to make sure I got all the lore right and all the characteristics right and all the everything right, um, and uh, so yeah, uh, and even then, yeah, there are still people like for oh God, my first supernatural novel, I screwed up. I got Dean's eye color wrong. <laughs> the the <laughs> only thing I can say in my defense is this show is very dark and and not very well lit, and I I screwed it up. I cop to it. In my second Supernatural book, there is one point where somebody, a woman who is flirting with Dean, makes a reference to his eye color, uses the same wrong eye color that I used in the first book, with Dean saying, "How? what an idiot this girl is. How can she think I have that color eyes? So, you know, <laughs> I, I, I at the very least cop to it and admitted my mistake. Um, stuff happens. You so know. we have um, a question. But, but I, I do, but the research is part of the fun for me. Not just that kind of research, but whatever... You know, when I like, if I have to learn, for example, I wrote a CSI New York book that took place in a medium security prison back in 2008. Um, and I got to do a tour of a medium security prison. I arranged it with the Department of Corrections here in New York. And I went down to Staten Island and, and got to wander around, excuse me, the uh, Arthur Kill pen, uh, Penitentiary, which was great. I learned so much on that trip. And I got to incorporate a lot of it into the novel. Um, and that's just, that's fun. You know, just digging into something and researching something and learning as much as you can about it and then trying to find all the different connections and different, you know, aspects of it and, and work it in there. Um, that's 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 part of the fun for me. So, yeah, lots of research. Yes. Um, and, you know, you try to do as much as possible precisely because and not just to avoid getting yelled at by fans, because if they're yelling at you for something you got wrong, you deserve to get yelled at. Um, it's to it's to make sure that I'm being true to the right. world. With that question There's in mind, uh, we have a question from Nicholas. Uh, has there been a novel that you would love to write in a in a world that you haven't touched yet, or maybe wanted to and didn't get a chance to do it? Oh God, there are tons. <laughs> um, I I actually pitched uh, a Quantum Leap novel and a Highlander novel back in the day when those novel lines were running. Um, neither of which made it, unfortunately. Um, and uh, uh, I would have loved to have written a Homicide Life on the Street novel. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of my favorite shows. But there were there were two novels based on that, but they were written by Jerome Preisler, who's a mystery author, and I can understand why they went with him. Um, uh, shout out to The Wire. Oh, yeah. No, The Wire is, like, my favorite one show of, ever. Uh, It's in my top um, five, hands down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, what else? I, I write a lot of police procedurals, so The Wire is one of my totems. Um the uh, I would have loved to have written a Babylon Five novel. Um, I would have loved to have written a Battlestar Galactica novel set in the in the Ron Moore. Well, you series. did write a Deep Space Nine one, or no? So then, oh, yeah. yeah, you got to write a yeah. Babylon Five there, basically. Specifically, <laughs> what I wanted to write for B Five was an Ivanova novel. I wanted uh, there was there was an idea for an Ivanova novel I had, but the opportunity to pitch one never really presented itself. Uh, so it, it never happened. Um, but it would have been cool. Um, I always loved that character, and I thought she she deserved a uh, her own story. Right. Um, the and there's there's others. Um, you know, there's there's lots of cool stuff that I would love to do tie-ins to, and who knows, it could still happen. All right, so give so. me another letter. Just pick a letter. Not K. oh, any letter at all. I'm Not sorry? K. Not K. Yes. Let's go with D. D? All right. What's D. the first D I see in the chat? Desiree. I see it. All right, Desiree, you just won a, a, a Serenity novel signed by Keith. So I got I to gotta ask you, Shiny. Brian, you brought this up, Keith, with when you were talking about the uh, your Supernatural books and being so mm -hmm. early, early in the uh, I I into it. So the, the big question now is, what do you feel like? I'm, I'm assuming you're you were still a fan of the show. You finished it. And yep. And uh so how do you feel about basically your character is God? 
<laughs> like, do you ever think about like you're God? So, like you you started it. It's so you. every single time <laughs> I'm at a convention and I have the supernatural novels for sale <laughs> in front of at a, if I'm at a booth that's selling them. I always tell people, yes, I have written official supernatural fiction, which by the mythology of the show makes me a prophet. <laughs> I do not say it makes me God because I want people to actually buy the book. And I think that claiming to be a deity is one step slightly too far. Um, in all seriousness, the when they introduced a guy who wrote supernatural novels as a character on the show, it freaked me the hell out. Um, Were you like, are just... they basing this on me? What's going on? Well, yeah. Um I mean, I was half expecting to see the covers to Nevermore and which is kind of phone key when they showed the books. Um, but uh, yeah, that was that was hilarious. I, I loved that. And then and then, yes, every writer's dream. Yes. The, the, the guy who writes the novels is actually God. Yeah, there so, you go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I uh, I got to work with Rob Benedict a few times and I floated the, the theory of the God theory with him and then. You know, and they finally revealed it in uh, what was it, the 200th episode, basically, when he comes back. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. I thought that was uh, it was a a nice, nice touch. And then they really made him like yeah. a horrible, horrible dick. Well, well yes. Marco, Marco's theory, Marco's theory has always been that they actually, if you re, if you look back at it, they reveal him in the Supernatural, the musical episode. They reveal. As he's sitting there watching the right. music. Well, that was the 200th episode. That's kind of your first. That was, yeah. yeah, that's kind of your first hint that, okay, this guy's something different. Well, but see, I got hints before that. Like back when he was just the prophet and he died as the prophet, mm -hmm. I, I there were several other hints that uh, even at that time that I even asked him when I did the signing with him, you know, do you think your character is God? And he was like, eh, maybe. I don't know. That'd be <laughs> awesome, right? You know. And, uh, and stuff like that. And that was way, that was probably like in 2009 or 11 or somewhere right around in there. Like that was way long ago that I did the signing with him. Uh, I just had to, when, when, when Marco told me that you were going to be on the show and I was like, I was like, oh man, this guy actually wrote like the first supernatural novel. He's God. That's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of years ago, an Albany newspaper called me a pop culture demigod. Uh, which has led to my parents <laughs> constantly arguing over which one of them is the actual God. So, so um, can you talk a little bit about, we, you, you touched a little bit about like how you only had a few weeks to write the Serenity novelization, but one of the reasons why you get a lot of work done is because of how quick you write quality work. Can you talk a little bit about like what what allows you to do so? I mean, like... Is it just not a lot of second guessing yourself? You know, is it a lot of? I mean, part of it is just practice. Uh, part of it is that I type really, really fast. Um, I'm, I'm like 150 words a minute or so, so I, that that helps immensely. Um, yeah, I, 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 I just I'm fast. Uh, I I could be faster. I could be a lot slower. Um, I'm not always as fast as I used to be either. I you know it. I, I I don't know. All I know is I just I just keep putting one word in front of the other until I'm done and um, hope that people like it. Um, I mean, a lot of it is self discipline. A lot of it is you know putting my butt in the chair, putting my fingers on the keyboard, and just letting letting it go. Uh, one of the hardest things to do, and and this is something I generally am am able to do, is not stress about the stuff I have no control over. Um, and also to know one, one of the most important pieces of writing advice I try to give people, in fact, so much so that it's actually on the license plate holder on my wife's and my car, which is your first draft is allowed to suck. <laughs> um, the, as long it's more important, the most important thing is to get the thing finished. Um, and then you can go back. It's much easier to fix and revise a finished story than it is a fragment. Um, and it's better not to just, it's better to just plow forward, get down as many words as you can. They're not all going to be great words. In fact, a lot of them are going to be oh. the. So don't stress about it. Just get it done. And once it's finished, you can then polish it and mold it and adjust it and fix it and make it into hopefully a really good piece of work. Um, 
you don't want to keep dithering over the same bits you've been working on over and over again because your parents were right. If you keep picking at it, it'll never heal. So just go forward. And that's, I think that's the main thing. I just, I just try to make sure I get words down. And if they're not the best words, then I'll go back later and make them better right. words. As long as they're not the best words. No, they can be the best words. I'd be okay with that. <laughs> right. so as somebody who has, you have, you kind of have uh, different groupings. You have your own original properties that yes. you've done. And then you have your licensed properties that are original stories that you've done. And yeah. then you have novelizations of stories you're given. Yes. So with that, do you find it easier in either creating your own world or creating stories within a world or novelizing something given to you? It's none of them is easier or harder than the other. Um, it's, you still have to make a story. Um, you still have to make interesting characters doing interesting things that are going to make people want to get through to the end. Um, whatever, whatever ease you get in a novelization because the, uh, hello, my, and my cat is here. Well, that happens um, to us all the time. <laughs> I, no, Kaylee, no. <sighs> Sigh. Go away. Um, <laughs> where was I? Um, uh, whatever ease there is in the fact that you don't have to come up with a lot of the story for um, for a novelization is obviated by the incredibly horrible deadline you're probably under for it. <laughs> <laughs> While the two and a half weeks was unusual, um, although not unprecedented, um, I know people who've written movie novelizations over a weekend. Um, and I actually did one movie novelization once in 10 days, which then never got published. Oh. Um, I'm not bitter at that at all, about that at all. <laughs> um, is, uh, so that there's that. But uh, at the end of the day, you still, like I said, you have to make a story. Uh, and it's no easier or harder if somebody else came up with the world and the characters than if you did. And and hell, I mean, if I'm writing, for example, I'm one of one of my upcoming projects is the sixth novel in my fantasy police procedural series. I'm currently working on the second novel in my urban fantasy series. In both of those, the worlds have already been created. It just happened to be created by me. Yeah. But you know, I'm already plugging into an existing universe. It's just one that I made up and can change the rules on if I want to. But you know, it's still it's still basically the same process. Can you tell us a little so bit about both time. of those properties? And I think I'll put a link uh, uh, sure. in uh, uh, when I publish this to the non-live. I'll put a link. Uh, I think on your you have a blog where you can buy signed copies and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and and you can you can pretty easily find me online. Um, if you go to decandido.net right now, it's a terrible website that's just basically a cheap looking. Uh, link dump. I'm in the process of getting it revised. Oh, I thought you were just going dra basically dragging it into the. I thought you were going century. '90s retro. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it sort of became '90s retro by default because I haven't really learned any new coding since 1996. But um, anyway, the the Fantasy Police Procedural series started with a novel called Dragon Precinct, which was originally published in 2004. Um. And that's uh, it's a mixture of epic fantasy in the Tolkien D and D style, uh, mixed with police procedure in the Hill Street Blues homicide, the Wire style. Um, so the two main characters are detectives who solve crimes. They just happen to do it in a medieval fantasy type setting: sword and sorcery, wizards, elves, dwarves, hobgoblins, that sort of thing. Um, the books include Dragon Precinct, Unicorn Precinct, Goblin Precinct, Griffin Precinct, and Mermaid Precinct. Uh, I am hoping to have Phoenix Precinct out by the end of this year. Uh, and then after that will be Manticore Precinct. And there's also a short story collection called Tales from Dragon Precinct. Uh, and there will be a second short story collection imaginatively titled More Tales from Dragon Precinct. Um, and then the urban fantasy is uh, actually set here in New York. Uh, specifically in the Bronx, which is the northernmost of the five boroughs. Um, and uh, the first book was called A Furnace Sealed, and it's the adventures of Brom Gold, who is a courser. He's basically a supernatural hunter for hire. Um, picture Supernatural or the Dresden Files, only uh, unlike Supernatural, this is something that he actually does for a living, and also unlike Supernatural, he does not have a cool car. Um <laughs> 
Uh, he has a 2003 Toyota Corolla. Um, and, uh, and it's similar to the Dresden Files in some ways, except uh, uh, Brom doesn't wield magic. Um, he's not a, he's not a wizard. Uh, he's just a guy who hunts supernatural creatures. He sometimes hire subcontracts wizards. Um, but he has to deal with various supernatural happenings, uh, in the Bronx, uh, corralling werewolves, uh, hunting down unicorns, that sort of thing. Um, the book, first book is called A Furnace Sealed and it involves a bunch of immortals who are being killed, possibly by vampires, possibly by something else. Um, and the second book is called Feet of Clay and it involves a golem that uh, has been created as well as a dragon that is hanging around in uh, poor some poor guy's backyard. So Yeah, The Dresden Files was always one of my favorites. Uh, I, I don't read as I, much as I like, but Jim Butcher was always up there. The, 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 the comp that people have, that I've seen most often in reviews has been to The Dresden Files, and I'll take it. <laughs> when you talk yeah. about like writing, I, I always hear that the first Dresden Files, he was in college and he wrote it. And his professor told him yep. it was absolute garbage. Like it was the worst thing he'd ever read. Yep. Like it was just, you know, and he even admits like there's a lot that he learned, you know, that he made up for. But but you brought up the 2003 Corolla. That was one of the things I liked that in the Dresden Files, he can't drive cars that have any electronics in them yep. because it's, anytime he's around electronics, they go out. And with that, and one more thing before I think we'll we'll call it a night, but we're definitely going to have to have you back on because I could go another two or three hours. <laughs> um, and when you were talking about like keeping the story, the faith of the story and writing and um, the characters' voices, and you were talking about what Cisco would say versus Picard would say, one of the best things I found out about this season of Discovery was how mm -hmm. each character who took turn as captain was trying to find their, uh, make it so, or like their, or, or let's, uh, engage, you know, and then they end the yeah. series, like with, with their name going, now let's fly or something like that. Like it yeah. was, let's fly was, that was, yeah, it was yeah. just, it was cool how they tried to like, I just, I loved, I, I loved the fact that Saru was actually like, working with Tilly to try to find his catchphrase. Yeah. Um, cause that, that's one of the things I love about Saru. What, I, one, I, I really, I'm really enjoying Discovery, and one of the things I like in particular about it is the character yeah. of Saru, and and one of the things I love is how joyfully analytical he is. Um, you know, the first time we saw him take command back in the first season, he was, you know, going through a list of of well regarded captains and trying to see what they would do and trying to emulate them, and and then again, you know, when when he when he took over in this past season, he was, you know. He made a list, and he's trying to, you know, figure out what the best way to do various things is, and it's and I love it. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious to see if they bring him back for next season the way they ended it. He's, he's supposed to be yeah. back, so because it was one of those things that they left it like, wait, is Saru not coming back? <laughs> you know, but you know, you got to keep up your your tradition of having a different captain every yeah. year. So you know, but uh, <laughs> well, with uh, with that said, um, it's been a pleasure. And I hope we we kept uh, the questions original enough for you. Did did I get one in there that uh, hadn't been asked? Well, there was another. There was another question that got asked, and I think I can answer it quickly. Um, uh, what would you say is your biggest accomplishment in writing, and what is the one you're most proud of? Aside from being on this show. Uh, well, aside from that, yes, obviously. <laughs> but um, I think I, I don't know if it's the one I'm most proudest of, but it's right up there in the top five or so. Um, I created. In, in the Star Trek fiction, I created a character named Nanbako, who was elected Federation president in a novel called A Time for War, A Time for Peace. I then did a novel that focused on her first year in office called Articles of the Federation. That character then went on to become a major supporting player uh, in the Star Trek, in the, but not only in the Star Trek prose fiction that Simon & Schuster was doing, but also in the Star Trek online game. Uh, she became a major part of the backstory of the mm -hmm. game. Um, the, the Star Trek online people did this incredibly detailed backstory, um, of leading up to the year 2409 when the, when the game takes place and president Baco was a major part of that storyline. Um, I created that character as a tribute to my great grandmother, uh, who died in 2003 at the age of 98. Uh, Nana could easily have run the Federation, um, without any trouble at all. Uh, this is a woman who who came over to this country from Italy in the early part of the 20th century, moved out to rural western Pennsylvania, and had 10 kids at the height of the Depression. 
Um, and she became the matriarch of this massive, wonderful family of which I am a small part. And like I said, she could have run the Federation, no problem. And I'm really, I'm really thrilled and proud of the fact that she became such an important character written by a whole lot of people who are not me. (laughs) Um, uh, You know, I wrote her in, you know, her first appearance and then the novel and two other novels. And that was it. Most of her appearances have been written by other people. Uh, and, and she, you know, she kind of took on a life of her own and that was a huge thrill, you know? Um, I mean, it's not, it, it's, I was talking with Timothy Zahn about this at a convention, you know, and he talking about the, the impact that the character of Grand Admiral Thrawn had and how thrilled he was when Thrawn sh- started showing up on Star Wars Rebels. Um, and, and, you know, conti- has continued to become a part of the greater tapestry of the Star Wars universe. And it's a character he created. Um, that's cool. Um, and, you know, we don't get any financial remuneration for this unless we get to write more books on it because that's not how this works. You know, we we create characters in these universes knowing that we don't get to control them after that. Um, but it's still nifty, the fact that that President Baco is is this major character in in the Star Trek fiction and in the Star Trek games. And, and, and I think Nana would have been proud. You have to ask him what he thinks about the rumors of uh, Thawne being played by Robert Downey Jr. in The Mandalorian coming up next season. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> That's what the rumors are, is that Robert Downey Jr. is going to take on that role. That would be interesting. On Mandalorian. That would be very interesting. All right. Well, like I said, we're going to have, definitely have to have you on again because I got through probably 20% of the questions I wanted to ask. So. <laughs> It would it would have been it would have been better if I gave shorter oh, answers. No, but no, that's not at all. Like I said, we're like very freestyle no, on this show. All. This is all improv, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's just I always like to have some questions just in case, you know. But yeah. uh, so definitely want to want to have you back on again. And uh, yeah, be happy. And meantime, if if anybody watching this has further questions, I'm very easy to find online. Um, I'm at decendido.net, which has links to. All my social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Um, I, uh, I I also write regularly for Tor.com, uh, where I've been reviewing episodes of the new Star Trek series and doing rewatches of old Star Trek series, as well as pieces on various uh, screen adaptations of comic book superheroes and some other stuff as well. Um, I have a YouTube channel where I've been reading my short fiction called Crad COVID Readings. I obviously started that last year. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, where, where I do readings of my short fiction, please check that out. And I have a Patreon, um, patreon.com slash crad, K-R-A-D, my initials. I'll put um, links to all this I inside. Do, yes, I appreciate that. The, uh, the Patreon includes movie reviews, TV reviews, excerpts from my works in progress, um, and uh, uh, bleh, I'm losing it, uh, cat pictures. That's very important. <laughs> uh, vignettes featuring my original characters. Uh, the characters I mentioned before, the Dragon Precinct and the Brown Gold and some of my other original fiction as well. And also um, f- first looks at my first drafts. Um, the most expensive tier is $20 a month. And most of them are, you know, you can do as little as $1 a month, which will get you the movie reviews. Uh, $2 a month gets you the movie reviews and the cat pictures. And the cat pictures are adorable. You saw Kaylee walking by here before. She, you know, And she's only one of them. We've got two cats, two black cats, Kaylee and Louie. They're adorable. You just so, got to be careful where you're um, walking, right? Uh, well, yes, there is that. <laughs> All right. My dad jokes aside, um, <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, thank you for watching, everybody. And uh, when I repost this thank later, you all for coming. I appreciate I'll it. repost this later with all those links, and we'll give away the third book next week on next week's show. Uh, I'll pull a comment out and uh, give it away. So thank you, everybody.